opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is your host, Michael McAuliffe, bringing you the latest stories from Nevada and beyond. Uh, my co-hosts, uh, uh, Perry Haichu and Kurt Duhach, are off this week, and so we'll be, uh, we'll be going solo on this one. So we have some local news. Um, there's always something in the news uh, about pot these days uh, because it has just become uh, so much into the mainstream. And here in Nevada, of course, we have question two on the ballot, which is in uh, less than three months now. And uh, people are, are lining up for and against. And the polls have narrowed since March when we had a 60-40 uh, favorable rating uh, to the latest that I've seen is 50-41. So there's a nine-point spread, which is still safe, but um, it is closing up. And now um, we have from MarijuanaBusinessDaily.com an article published just yesterday which um, says, oh, surprise, surprise, right? Opposition to Nevada Rec now includes AG and law enforcement. Um, we're shocked about this one, aren't we, guys? I mean, just the idea that um, that the cops in Nevada would oppose something which would make it uh, more difficult for them to do low-level, uh, low-hanging fruit type of arrests of people. Uh, they don't like that. So Nevada, uh, Nevada's Attorney General and other top law enforcement officials have come out forcefully against the, the ballot initiative to legalize adult use marijuana in the state of Nevada. The group cited various concerns late, late last week ranging from the initiative being a money grab by the marijuana industry to public safety and the possibility that edibles would appeal to kids. Uh, and they did this on uh, Channel 4 NBC up in Carson City. And uh, obviously we have a medical marijuana program in place already. So, um, you know, and as far as being a, a money grab, uh, there are those who would argue, and I'm usually one of them, uh, who would say that the uh, medical marijuana industry as devised in 2013 is a big money grab. Uh, unlike many other states, Nevada allows for-profit dispensaries as opposed to, to not-for-profit. And so you had a, a large bunch of, uh, of investment groups get together and throw in millions of dollars in a couple of cases. Uh, $10 million or more in order to get these properties, in order to uh, to get these licenses and um, move forward. Now, if I, I don't want to belittle anyone's altruistic nature, but the idea that they spent all this money uh, solely to help the patients and bring compassionate relief to uh, these few thousand people in the state, um, that's kind of a stretch for me. Uh, I really think that um, you know when you're talking about a money grab uh, of the rich and powerful and politically connected, uh, you look at Nevada's medical marijuana program uh, establishment program, and uh, you don't have to look far to see examples of that. But anyway, the um, uh, so the AG and the cops uh, think that that uh, this will be a money grab. Um, Sure, you know, as much as anything is a money grab in America. Banks go into business to make money. Car makers go into business to make money. TV stations, magazines, uh, your corner grocer doesn't go in every day uh, just to, to pay his bills and nothing more. Well, the, the entire capitalist society of America is essentially a money grab. So uh, are the people behind question two guilty of that? Yeah, well, probably, but that makes them part of the norm of America. Not 
something uh, uh, out of the ordinary. Um, according to Attorney General Adam Laxalt, this ballot initiative, and I quote, was written by major marijuana interests whose biggest concern is making money. Now, personally, I've never met major marijuana. But I hear he's an okay guy, uh, you know, and making money. We, we just talked about that. Um, what else would you be going into business for? Um, I've, I've gone to chiropractors over the year, and, you know, they do wonderful things, and, and they straighten your body out and all this sort of stuff. But, no, don't forget, they're there to make money. So um, I, I just don't uh, – uh, I, I don't get his rationale here, and it's uh, – Frankly, it sounds a little un-American to me. Uh, so uh, a spokesman for uh, question two, uh, Joe Bresney, who is a friend of the show, we've had him on recently, he brushed aside these criticisms and he noted that there's already a thriving black market in Nevada. Legalization, by contrast, will increase tax revenue and ensure that cannabis products are safe and regulated. And if you read study after study, as I have, uh, around the country, um, teen use goes down in states with medical marijuana programs or with uh, legalization. Uh, it is just, in the case of medical programs, it is no longer the forbidden fruit when you can go find it in grandma's uh, medicine cabinet. And for the legalization states, uh, anybody who has a license is just like a 7-Eleven uh, selling beer or wine. Uh, they have a lot to lose if they sell to underage uh, kids. And so they just don't don't do it. Now, is the black market out there? Yes, absolutely it is. It's huge in Nevada and some of the uh, some of the product comes uh, from Mexico or from uh, Central America, some of it comes from California and certainly some of it is homegrown as well. Uh, but the idea is that if you have a regulated product you and you have people able to go into stores and pick from, you know, four or five dozen different strains as opposed to uh, just being uh, given one or two choices from a, a guy who shows up in a car and you're picking up your eighths off a Craigslist or something like that. I, I think most people will go for that. Even, even though there will be a, a tax on this, uh, I think that uh, most people would prefer to be legal and have less hassle or less potential hassle in their lives. So coming up with this is not going to if we pass question two, it's not going to increase uh, usage, but what it will do is it will take the usage that already exists and charge a tax, charge a convenience fee, as it were, for these people to use it and be able to go down to any of uh, 80 licensed stores that, that there will be in the state that will do this in the first round. Uh, and that money will go into the education fund. It'll fund K through, through 12 education as opposed to just right now going into the black market and, and uh, paying for Special K and hookers and all sorts of uh, other things for black marketeers. So it, it does make a lot of sense that this one uh, should pass. And, and nonetheless, it's, um, it's going to be a close vote. When I said uh, earlier 50% uh, of the people are in favor of it, those numbers can tighten significantly, especially when you've got someone like Sheldon Edelson, who's, uh, who he and his wife are very much against this, uh, and they have gobs of money to spend. And, and I'm not trying to paint him as a bad guy. Uh, Sheldon is uh, so committed to getting a, a football stadium in here that he just recently has committed or promised to commit uh, up to $650 million of his own money to make sure this stadium gets purchased and built. So, you know, he, he is doing good things for Las Vegas, but because of a, a family tragedy uh, in not involving cannabis at all, um, he and his family are very anti-drug and throw uh, cannabis under that whole umbrella. And, and I wonder, though, if that would, would go far so far as to include uh, antibiotics and uh, aspirin and uh, heart drugs and various other things. They're all drugs, right? But they say, oh, they're not, they're not illegal drugs. Well, 
uh, they're only illegal because of foolish actions by members of Congress back in the 1930s. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And and really, if we just judge this substance by its properties, by its uh, potential to help us, um, it would be uh, in the lexicon of all time great plants. And it would not be something that they're still putting people in jail for. And we've talked about that in the past few programs, uh, where the, the federal government is still going after people for ridiculously small amounts of money. And uh, we've also talked about the fact that we need to get these changes. And it's not just a case of uh, the Clinton campaign saying they'll schedule down to schedule two. We really need to get cannabis descheduled on a, uh, on a federal level uh, and get that prohibition on a federal level stopped. Now, the states can do what they want with that. We still have wet states and dry states with alcohol, wet counties, dry counties. Uh, the same thing will happen with cannabis, but we should give the states and the local populations the freedom with which to make those decisions themselves. Uh, this is definitely not a one-size-fits-all solution for the country. So uh, Sheldon Adelson, it, it mentions, and you know, I, I had heard earlier this year that he was going to pump up to five million dollars uh, in the anti um, uh, initiative. Uh, we haven't seen that happen yet, and uh, as I said, he's kind of focused on the Raiders, and boy, I hope he stays focused there, because um, really, uh, it would be much better for the state and for the people and for the kids of Nevada uh, if we pass question two in the fall. So, speaking of the police, as I did just in this last segment, um, we have a, a very uh, interesting and um, righteous decision coming out of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals last week. And for those of you who don't know, the, the way that the structure, uh, the judicial structure in this country works is up at the very top you've got the Supreme Court and down at the lower levels you've got um, uh, district courts, uh, justice courts. Uh, in some states, you will have court of appeals. Nevada does not have a court of appeals. If you have a local court issue, you go directly from your trial judge up to the Nevada State Supreme Court. But that wouldn't work on a federal level because there are too many cases and it's too big. Uh, so there is something called the circuit. And there are, um, there are, I believe, 11 circuits in the country right now. Uh, and they're, they're uh, broken up geographically. We here in Nevada are in the ninth circuit uh, traditionally considered the uh, the most liberal or progressive circuit in the country and just recently uh, the Ninth Circuit affirmed that the federal government cannot spend dollar one going after patients or providers in medical marijuana states who are complying with the uh, state rules uh, and now we have uh, another circuit the Tenth Circuit in Denver ruling that it is unconstitutional for law enforcement officials to profile motorists based on their license plates. Uh, the ruling was handed down in a case uh, filed by a Colorado resident who was detained by two Kansas Highway Patrol officers while driving on Interstate 70. And boy, I, I've made that run several times myself back and forth between here and New York. And um, I can tell you from personal experience that I have had state troopers follow my vehicle for miles just waiting for me to drift out of a lane or to fail to signal or to do anything else but you know you don't give them a reason and if they don't have a reason to pull you over they can't but what they have been doing largely is profiling vehicles on where they are and and once again in my own personal experience I remember back in the 80s um, I had a girlfriend who had a, a a car with Florida plates and we were living in New York had driven out to see a friend in Pennsylvania and on the way back in New Jersey I got pulled over for doing 57 and a 55 and well the Supreme Court has said that even a mile or two over the limit officers are um, uh, entitled to pull you over uh, but they were pulling me over not because I was going 57 but because the plates were Florida plates and of course back in the 1980s cocaine from Florida was the big thing and so um, this was a case where they just pulled me over and searched the car uh, didn't find anything there was nothing to find um, but they did it based on the fact that those plates were Florida plates so now you have um, uh, Kansas, uh, who Kansas and Oklahoma recently uh, had filed a, uh, 
filed a case with the circuit court uh, to overturn Colorado's uh, legalization program, saying that the spillover was affecting their states. And uh, the, the court uh, handed down a decision saying that uh, that doesn't matter if uh, it, it's not enough if you're saying people are coming over into your state with cannabis. That's up for your police. That's up for your people to stop. It's not uh, the fault of the state of Colorado or the people of the state of Colorado who voted to legalize it. And so that got over, that, that was denied. So now you have the, the police uh, in Kansas and, and several other states around Colorado uh, pulling motorists over just because they've got the wrong license plate. Um, so uh, the, the, um, the plaintiff in this case was stopped uh, on the basis that Colorado is known to be home to medical marijuana dispensaries. Oh my God, shocking. And that I-70 is a known drug corridor despite running over 2,000 miles long from Utah to the East Coast. And, and a known drug corridor. I have heard and read over the years that almost every single major road in America is a known drug corridor. And, and you know, the excuse, the excuse kind of wears thin after a while. And the court wrote, it is time to abandon the pretense that state citizenship is per a permissible basis upon which to justify the detention and search of out-of-state motorists and time to stop the practice of detention of motorists for nothing more than an out-of-state license plate. And, and kudos to Circuit Judge Carlos Lucero who wrote the court's opinion. You know, now that we have 37 states and the, dis and the District of Columbia that have some form of medical marijuana laws in place, uh, Lucero noted that such practices from law enforcement would justify the search and seizure of the citizens of more than half of the entire country. The court decision sets a legal precedent for the entire Tenth Circuit, meaning Colorado, Kansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Utah, and Wyoming. And uh, it does not apply in states beyond that unless this state were to get taken up to the Supreme Court and decided there. But other circuits will generally look at what a given circuit court has done and they will try to align their views uh, often as closely as possible uh, in order to have a, um, a, a homogenous effect through the country. Well, we're going to just take a quick break now and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Stay by us. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledge will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www www.nevadapure.com Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is your host, Michael McAuliffe, and we're talking about uh, issues cannabis from Nevada and beyond uh, to uh, inform, enlighten, and educate you for your own self protection. So we have another story here uh, from uh, MDB.com, that's the Marijuana Business Daily uh, by Ellie McVeigh, uh, and the story is entitled Recreational Marijuana Pushing Down MMJ Patient Counts. Um, 
this is hardly surprising, and, and we'll get into it. But you know, it, it's not a case where uh, a lot of people got on these programs, at, you know, 20 years old with a hangnail or a backache or something like that. But there are uh, there are other reasons for why. Uh, patients would choose to get off a program uh, once that they've already been on it and you have legalization. So according to Ellie, the legalization of recreational marijuana has put a big dent in the state's pre-existing medical cannabis market according to, uh, to a look at changes in the number of registered patients in Colorado and Oregon. And these patient numbers have fallen by about 8% in Colorado and 14% in Oregon since the first adult use sales in each market. And it's unclear where the bottom of this is going to be. Uh, both states could conceivably see further decreases in patients who use cannabis occa only occasionally uh, to continue you to switch to the rec market and you know that using occasionally I have run into patients over the years uh, most of them are constrained by financial difficulty and if, if finances were not uh, a question they would be uh, utilizing more cannabis in their in their therapy to medicate themselves however there are some people who only use a small amount anyway and whereas you could say the average uh, use amount is about an ounce a month there are some people who will make that that ounce stretch three four even six months so all they need is the smallest amount to offset their symptoms they're not looking to get high they're looking for relief and so they wind up not going through a whole lot of it. So Colorado and Oregon, uh, as we mentioned, are the only states in the nation with both an active recreational marijuana industry and a pre-existing medical cannabis industry. Uh, and Oregon began by selling retail marijuana through the existing medical dispensaries last October. And this is uh, very much what we're going to do here in Nevada. Uh, and by July of 2016, uh, nine months later, patient counts in the state fell to uh, 67,158. Now, that's, that's a 14% decline and the lowest count since the program began uh, keeping records. And really, the uh, the Colorado program started taking off back in 2009 once the uh, their state Supreme Court ruled that uh, patients had a right to access in dispensary formats. Now Colorado is really an interesting state compared to Nevada because there are a lot of similarities and it makes a, a very good basis for comparison with Nevada. Uh, Colorado has 1.9 times as many people, so we can say about twice as many people, so it's very easy for figuring numbers. We're both intermountain west states. Uh, both states have uh, large red rural areas with two urban blue areas in the meaning, red and blue meaning Republican and, and Democratic. And so there are a lot of similarities in uh, the demographics of these states. And so we can, we can look pretty much at Colorado and see what's going on. Now, also uh, the Colorado and, and Nevada medical marijuana program started within just a few months of each other. And they were pretty much on track with the same number of patients per capita uh, for the first eight years of the program. But then when Colorado uh, opened up dispensaries and allowed dispensaries to open, all of a sudden the patient numbers shot up and they went in one 12 month period from 8,800 to 88,000. And they peaked about a year later in 2010 uh, at about 115, 120,000 if I recall correctly. But then afterwards, uh, as we're seeing from this article, these numbers start to drop. And once you have legalization, the numbers drop even more. So, uh, the, according to the article, um, Colorado's medical marijuana patient counts actually rose 6% in the nine months following recreational legalization, but the counts have fallen somewhat since then. Now, fortunately, revenue uh, does not necessarily correlate with patient counts uh, as sales of MMJ in Colorado are actually up 8% through the first half of, of 2016 compared to the same period of 2014. More people out there token up, it sounds like. Uh, Oregon does not release sales data, so it's difficult to uh, assess the full impact there. Um, 
both Colorado and Oregon require an annual written recommendation from a physician and the list of qualifying conditions between the two states is similar as, as it is in most states in the country uh, and they both include chronic pain as does Nevada and that's the most prevalent condition treated with medical marijuana by a wide margin uh, and you know this is where the people who uh, who are opponent to this uh, to these programs chime in and they say oh well you know people are just claiming pain and people are just kind of uh, emphasizing or magnifying the amount of pain they have just in order to get on the program and my own personal feeling is that you cannot determine somebody else's pain they have to they have to give you an indication uh, typically in a hospital or a doctor's office they they ask you to rate it on a one to ten scale um, but it's it's a very personal thing some people they have the slightest little headache and you will see them suffering and other people could have a massive industry and remain stoic and and they have a very high pain level so um, really it's it's difficult to quantify and uh, it's very presumptuous of people in high political office thinking that they can do that for others so the thing is though that in Oregon the annual cost to register as a medical marijuana patient cardholder in the state is $200 um, in Colorado by contrast the medical cardholders pay just $15 annually and Oregon also charges an additional uh, $200 fee to uh, MMJ patients who choose to grow their own and Colorado has no such cultivation fee so you've got uh, in in Oregon you have to pay the state 200 bucks for your license if you choose not to go in to dispensaries and not to support the commercial market you have to pay the state another two hundred dollars a year and then on top of that there's the visit to the doctor which can run hundred hundred fifty two hundred dollars as well uh, and Colorado uh, to their credit uh, they since 2009 they've lowered the the cost to their patients uh, of their their annual card from ninety to fifteen dollars now I, I just mentioned the cost of the doctor's evaluation uh, they're saying it, it can go up to 250 and and we've seen here in the state of Nevada certain providers charging even more than that um, in Oregon for example uh, medical marijuana patients do not pay state taxes on their pur purchases while in Oregon they're subject to a 2.9 percent tax now the odd thing there is that medicines are not supposed to be subject to sales tax food yeah clothing yeah sure various other other items yes but medicines are not supposed to be subject to this and yet you have built in to Colorado a 2.9 percent tax and here in Nevada even though the patient doesn't pay it directly uh, there are two percent excise taxes from the produ from the cultivator to the producer and then from the producer again to the dispensary and so it just adds those costs in that, that you know other things being equal patients should not have to pay uh, however these um, these laws were passed and sold on the idea that it's going to generate a bunch of revenue f to the state and the revenue that it's generating is not just in the case of um, of fees application fees annual licensing fees but that uh, those excise taxes uh, form a big chunk of that revenue to the state so you're not going to see them going away uh, anytime soon so according to the article here, assuming that an MMJ patient in Oregon paid $200 for a doctor recommendation and $200 to register for the program, the individual would need to spend $2,000 annually to break even on their exemption from the 25% tax paid by recreational customers. So. Um, Yes, in, in Oregon, if, if you are a recreational customer and you walk in and you buy a hundred dollars worth of weed, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a twenty-five dollar tax on that to you. That's that's pretty amazing. And there are so many elements of uh, of our political process who are for small t low taxes limited government personal responsibility and all that sort of stuff but it runs right up against the wall of pot and all of a sudden uh, I don't know what they've been smoking but they completely changed their view they say oh yeah taxes are fine let's get a lot of taxes on this and uh, anyway we won't we won't we won't go there 
So while certain patients have conditions that necessitate the level, this kind of level of spending, being two thousand dollars or so, um, they require who might require higher potency. Um, such high costs to entry have many patients who are treating less severe. Uh, conditions, questioning whether it's worth staying in the program, and they choose instead to purchase in the retail market. Mm -hmm. And I, I've got to say, it's not only that, but there has always been a stigma which has not dissipated yet about medical cannabis and medical cannabis patients. And there is also a lack of trust between patients and their state as to whether the information that they have is truly private or whether it is passed on to the federal government, as happened in Nevada for the first nine years of its program. So I can certainly understand that if you have a state where RECs passed, that there are a lot of people who want to keep their health information private. And so they don't register for a program. And if they were registered for a program, why renew? Why give that current status? Uh, you know, every time that you get pulled over, the police can see whether you're on the program or not. And so a lot of people, I think, in these states are, are choosing to do this because they want to maintain their privacy. And, and that's something of interest to us all. Uh, so really, on a state level here in Nevada, but also on the federal level, uh, we should be looking at protecting people's rights. Uh, just uh, tomorrow and uh, um, Thursday, the Governor Sandoval is go going to be holding a, uh, a summit on prescri prescription drug abuse in this country. And uh, the bulk of what they're doing in these, uh, uh, in these forums and in legislation that has been passed recently is shifting the burden of responsibility and, and the, uh, the hammer of enforcement onto doctors, uh, despite the fact that, um, that many of these uh, uh, these opioids that people are taking uh, are coming bootleg uh, through the street and that in fact when you do crack down on doctors and they then then reduce the number of of pain prescriptions that they'll write these people will go to heroin street uh, opioids and uh, they're less safe uh, and they're less expensive which is why people go to them but it's not a direction we should be sending people into so uh, we'll talk a little more uh, after a quick commercial break and we'll be right back Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour uh, for continuing discussion on uh, items of cannabis interest for people uh, around the state and around the world. Uh, and I should say to our friends in Israel, Shalom, uh, because uh, I, see, I have two stories here from Israel uh, which are uh, very interesting. You know, and, and one of them, as I get into it, and it comes from Chris Roberts uh, over at uh, Cannabis Now magazine. Um, and it says Israel begins cannabis autism study could start exporting weed so a cannabis autism study I can't tell you how many times over the past 15 years that I have been a patient advocate and activist and going out and talking to people and, and listing off well cannabis does this and cannabis fights that and cannabis helps with this and kind blah 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 you know 
point after point after point, uh, both of uh, the pharmaceutical benefits uh, in the human body, uh, the benefits of, of commercial industrial hemp. And, and after, after a while or after hearing all these things, people say to me, oh, you know, you, you've got to be making this stuff up. It, no, nothing can be so good. Nothing can have such positive effect and and you know answer to to so many you know different needs of humanity and um I promise you i don't make this up i just i just read a lot and this is what i find and all around the world uh people look for different uses and not only for of cannabis of, of everything perfume uh, one of the key ingredients of perfume uh, comes from whale vomit so somebody had to take that whale vomit at some time and and say well what can we do with this you know uh, with anything we're, we're a curious species and so we come across things and they'll do something and we want to know well what else can they do and so we know that uh, cannabis is effective uh, for reducing tumors in, in certain cancers. We know that it is effective uh, as an anti-inflammatory, as a, as a palliative uh, for pain relief, that it helps people with Crohn's disease, uh, that it helps people with MS, with, with a great variety, that it's as an anti-inflammatory. It's a great muscle relaxant. In the show last week, we were talking about how a UFC fighter uh, was using his post fight uh, in order to treat the pain that he had from from being beaten up when he lost that match uh, and so you know people just astounded by it but I'm just amazed that we keep finding new and new things and and I've said for a long time if we didn't get you high the plant itself would be considered a miracle plant by humanity and used in just about everything so here we are in Israel, and they're rapidly becoming the promised land of medical cannabis research uh, and potentially the source of medical grade marijuana for researchers the world over. And yet another first uh, from the country where researchers first isolated THC, and that was uh, uh, Professor uh, Professor. Raquel uh, McCollum back in 1964 at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, they first discovered THC and, and they discovered also at that point the bodies, the human body's own uh, internal endocannabinoid system. Well, an Israeli researcher is now laying down plans to conduct the world's first study into whether cannabis aids people with autism. Uh, Dr. Adi Aran's planned investigation into whether medical cannabis will aid 120 low to medium functioning autistic individuals will have the blessing of Israel's health ministry and will be the first of its type. And this is just another example of, of if you get rid of the stigma, if you get rid of the social uh, um, denigrating of cannabis if you uh, open it up for research as we're just starting to do in this country with uh, with opening a few more research uh, uh, opportunities uh, uh, from the federal government you can come up with all sorts of amazing things now one of autism's best known symptoms is its inability to understand normal social cues studies have shown that an increased activity uh, at the CB1 endocannabinoid receptor has improved social function, suggesting that a potential treatment in autism may lie in substances that trigger that receptor. And that endocannabinoid CB1 system uh, has been um, inside of humans before we were humans. It goes back way, way back in evolution uh, to what they call deep time, about 600 million years ago. And uh, the body produces its own uh, endocannabinoids that that fit like keys into those receptors, but so does the cannabis plant. It fits in nicely, which is why we have both a, a, a euphoric high effect and we have pharmaceutical effects. So uh, Aaron is the head of pediatrics at the Sher Zedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. He's already appro received approval in principle from the health ministry to conduct his study and is in the process of funding, finding research subjects. Uh, several Israeli families with severely autistic members have already received permission to use medical cannabis and have found some positive results. Uh, according to one nurse, administering CBD oil three times daily to autism sufferers calmed them down significantly and made them less prone to violence. Uh, however, more study is needed, but the idea is they're getting out there and they're going to do that, do those studies. Now, 
at the same time in Israel, and this comes from Derek Stanley over at Hemp News, um, the Israeli agricultural minister, Yuri Ariel, said, said Sunday, and that's just uh, two days ago Sunday, uh, that the country will begin exporting medical marijuana abroad. And boy, I'm going to be interested to see how that works. Um, in two years, he said, we will have protocols in place that will allow farmers to grow cannabis. The Agriculture Ministry has set up specific areas for research and, and trial of growing cannabis, a plant whose foremost use is the medical treatment of patients around the world. And I just got to sit back for a second and, and take in that statement. You know, here in America, they say, oh, you know, we'd say the foremost use of cannabis is illegal things, getting high and is, you know, uh, as they said in the 1930s, convincing black men to rape white women and listen to jazz music and stuff like that. But so you have a, a representative of the government of Israel saying that the foremost use of this plant is medical. And, you know, that's something that we need to uh, hammer it down to every one of our politicians in this country. Israel being a much smaller country than the United States, uh, only some 23,000 patients are, are on the medical program there. Uh, but with that 23,000, only 36 doctors are authorized to give prescriptions. Uh, the new measure means that thousands more people could benefit from this use. Uh, the new legislation has lifted the restriction of the number of growers and makers and, uh, uh, and makes medical cannabis available in pharmacies. The Justice Ministry in Israel has begun exploring the idea of decriminalizing the recreational use of marijuana. According to these new measures, those caught with soft drugs would be fined but not charged with a crime and that's exactly what we need to do in this country that's exactly what the talk about descheduling cannabis and treating it like alcohol or like tobacco is uh, that it's um, if you're if you're seeing that it works therapeutically pharmaceutically and you've got a handle on that and you're making uh, uh, you're making tax revenue which goes into the system then then the next logical step is to treat this substance that is one of the safest uh, known to mankind, uh, treat it uh, no more harshly than tobacco and alcohol, which uh, collectively kill half a million people a year in this country alone. So, uh, it, just such common sense. And I've, I've been saying this for years. I feel sometimes like I'm banging my head against the wall. So, on that, uh, on that, um, that note of finding new uses, and, and in this case, a study for autism, uh, there's, a, um, there's another report that's coming out of the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, by James Morgan, who is one of their science writers. And they're finding out that hemp fibers are better than graphene. Now, graphene is one of these new super materials uh, that have been developed just in the last 20 years or so, and uh, super strong, super conductive, uh, one of these uh, um, materials that is supposed to help take us out into the reaches of space and, you know, help make our smartphones smaller and lighter and just make our life in general a better thing. So according to um, uh, Mr. Morgan here, the waste fibers from hemp crops can be transformed into high performance energy storage devices. Wow, I guess somebody ought to call Elon Musk up in uh, Tesla. In in the north part of the state. Um, so uh, people ask me, why hemp? I say, why not? And that was Dr. David Mitlin of Clarkson University in New York. And he describes his device uh, in the journal ACS Nano. And I like that. People ask me, why hemp? I say, why not? Well, usually people ask me, you got a joint? And I say, no, sorry, I don't. But, um, but that's, that's good. He says, we're making graphene-like materials for a thousandth of the price, and we're doing it with waste. The hemp that we use is perfectly legal to grow, has no THC in it at all, so there's no overlap with any recreational activities. And the point there that where he says the thousandth of the price, yeah, the graphene that I mentioned earlier uh, is a super material. It is a very cutting edge material that they make these sheets that's only one molecule thick, and that can be very expensive to produce. So if you're taking a substance uh, and being able to reduce the cost of producing that a thousand fold, uh, you are opening up huge new vistas to 
the use of these superconductive materials. Um, and in countries including China, Canada, and the UK, hemp can be grown industrial for clothing and building materials, but the leftover bast fiber, the inner bark, typically ends up in landfill. And for those, those of you who are out there growing your own uh, for all these years, yes, once you strip the, uh, the flowers off and the sun leaves to make your butter and you've just got those stems and stalks, um, that, that inner stem material, you don't do anything with it but throw it away. However, they found this new use for it. Dr. Mitlin's team took these fibers and recycled them into supercapacitors, which are energy devices, uh, energy storage devices, pardon me, which are transforming the way electronics are powered. Conventional batteries store large reservoirs of energy and drip feed it slowly. You know, think, think of your flashlight, think of your, your wristwatch, uh, those sort of things. Whereas superconductors can rapidly discharge their entire load. They're ideal in machines that rely on sharp bursts of power. In electric cars, for example, supercapacitors are used for something called regenerator, regenerative braking. And that's the concept that when you slow down, you're transferring some of the energy from slowing down back into the batteries of the car. And so these superconductive materials are very, very good for that. Also, if you've seen um, images on the internet or occasionally in a store here or there, um, these uh, uh, little tchotchkes where you have a device that's free floating and it looks like it's anti-gravity, well, they're using superconductors to do that and to create that field. So stronger than diamonds, more conductive than copper, and more flexible than rubber, this metallic miracle uh, material was the target of a 50, 50 billion pound investment by the UK Chancellor. Now this is by the government, right? While, but while this carbon monolayer is, is state-of-the-art material for commercial supercapacitors, it's prohibitively expensive to, to produce. Now this is the, the graphene. Uh, finding cheap, sustainable alternatives is, is, is the specialty of Dr. Mitlin's former research group, the University of Alberta. They've experimented with all flavors of bio-waste, from peat moss to eggs, but uh, most recently they've turned banana peel into batteries. But if you look at hemp fiber with its structure, uh, it makes sheets with high surface area, and that's very conductive to supercapacitors. And, you know, talking about this here on, on, on this show, you might say, really? Well, you know, I just, I just want to get high, or, or, or I just want to treat my meds, uh, treat my condition with my meds. How does this affect me? Um, you might have asked the same thing 50 years ago when, uh, when they developed... Uh, silicon microchips in the space program when they when they came up with um, ceramic materials for the space shuttle tiles uh, these things are used all over the place now aluminum was was devised for World War two aircraft to because there was a shortage of steel to make lighter better performing aircraft and superconductors and supercapacitors are a next generation future material that um, you can't imagine what it might do for you now, but in 20 years, you'll wonder how you ever lived without it. Kind, kind of like the internet and our smartphones these days. So, um, it just some fascinating stuff happening all over the world. We're going to take one quick final break, and then we'll come back and wrap up. Stay From the you. soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. 
DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the DigiPath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Michael McAuliffe. So we have a couple of more things to do in our in our last uh, few minutes here, and uh, one of them was a story I looked at last week, and we just didn't get it on the air. But um, I, I've got to say that uh, it, it's really important because you know Schedule One drugs are scary stuff. They're the substances that the DEA has determined currently have no medical accepted use and high potential for abuse. Things like heroin, quaaludes, MDMA. Well. Philip Smith over at Alternet uh, uh, has written a story uh, telling about an overman who overdosed on a dangerous Schedule One drug and what happened. Well, you know, we know that over OD on smack, you're going to end up in the morgue. OD on weed, well, you might call your cat mean names. Uh, as, according to the Omaha World Herald, uh, police were called to the house uh, last Tuesday night to investigate an accidental overdose. The victim, a 53-year-old man, had um, found and devoured four brownies left in the back seat of his car that his adult kids had been using earlier that day. Well, the man's wife told police he began feeling bad anxiety while watching TV. She tried to call the kids and ask what was in the brownies, but got no answer. When, while police were at the scene, one of the children arrived and fessed up and told him the brownies belonged to his siblings and he was pretty sure it was just marijuana in the brownies. Well paramedics called to the scene, uh, checked the man, they found his vital signs to be normal, but they noted he was displaying odd behavior, crawling around on the floor, using profanities, oh my god, no shit, and calling the family cat a bitch. Oh my god, that's just beyond the pale. So the man told paramedics he felt like he's a trippin'. And he declined their offer, though, to be taken to the hospital. Well, the paramedics helped the man uh, to his bedroom. He got into bed. He and his wife were told to call 911 again if his situation worsened. Well, the still anonymous victim has recovered fully. And he's told the, uh, the World Herald, the local paper out there, in a follow-up article, that even in the paranoid, delirious depths of brownie poisoning, that he realized he wasn't having a stroke or a heart attack or going insane. Wow, he realized, I am really, really high. So now, you know, and overdosing is not a laughing matter. Um, uh, I've known a lot of people, a lot of patients over the years who've imbibed and um, it's easy to go too far with this. Personally, I am not a, a fan of, of edible cannabis. Uh, once you once you ingest it, uh, you're on that ride for six hours or more. Um, I, I've known patients who have uh, eaten too much and have uh, remained uh, uh, intoxicated for 14 hours. I knew one woman who, who stayed high for three days, and uh, that's not fun. It really isn't. And the, the big problem there is that you just got to be careful and time your ingestion. Don't, don't eat your cookie or eat your brownie and then 30 minutes later say, well, I don't feel anything and eat another one. And 30 minutes later say, oh, I still don't feel anything and eat another one. Because when, you, when it does kick in a few minutes after that, you are going to be on a ride that, that may, may not be pleasant. So I've got a couple of minutes left here, and I want to um, uh, I want to just get into uh, actually what I want to do is uh, I want to say that the weekend uh, pool party or the eighth annual pool party that we held this weekend was a terrific success. Uh, we had vendors at the uh, uh, at the party. We had lots of patients. It took place in a beautiful property up in the northwest uh, you know, with, a, with a nice pool in this summertime and uh, we do really appreciate all the support we have from the local community. Uh, the money that, that you bring into these parties uh, with the entry fee uh, allows us to, to help uh, veterans get on the program and let others who are indigent get on the program and so uh, 
from Jennifer and Kurt and Perry and uh, myself and and everyone who's associated with We Can Jason Startsman. I don't want to leave you out. Um, we really, really thank you for your continued support. The fact that uh, we have been able to make this group a go for eight years and are still moving forward and gearing up for the next legislative session is due in no small part to you guys out there uh, who uh, come to these parties, who come to our other events, who join We Can, and uh, you, it's just without you we would not be able to exist and even if we did we would just be a you know a bunch of people around a table in a basement with with no ability no finances to go out there and make these changes but because of your support we were able to get uh, a goodly number of changes into the law in 2013 in 2015 and we'll be looking forward to do that again in the 2017 legislature so give yourselves a pat on the back you too are part of the cannabis reform movement in Nevada and you're an important part so um, don't let anybody tell you otherwise with that uh, we're about out of time so we're gonna wrap up the show for this week uh, have a great Labor Day we'll see you after you get back stay safe stay careful and see you next time thanks for listening <laughs>